This episode of Capes and Lunatics is brought to you by Tweaked Audio. To get awesome headphones, go to tweakedaudio.com and use the coupon code SOUTHGATE to get 30% off, free shipping, and a lifetime warranty. Or you can get there through the link on our website, southgatemediagroup.com. This is Google Perk, and you're listening to the Capes and Lunatics podcast. The recording has started. Hello, dear friends. And welcome once again to Super Connectivity. I'm your host, Charlie, the Professor SM. <laughs> and with me, as always, is the blue eyed bomber from the Burger of Pits. Phil, Phil, me, and Parrot. Hey, Phil. Man, you sound excited to be here today. No, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Okay, okay. Oh, he tolerates me. So, so well. Um, <laughs> Philip, okay, uh, let's talk um, random thought. Today's random thought is, is Hawkeye broke Batman? Hmm. Tristan says yes. What do you say, Philip? Is Hawkeye broke Batman? Is Hawkeye uh, really a secret genius, inventive master, and brilliant detective with an uncanny sense of human knowledge and interaction even though he's always swayed by the bad girls um we're watching you black widow and catwoman mm. i mean if you want to uh, i mean if you want to present your argument but i mean i've i've never thought of him as broke batman i'm always thinking of him as, as like you know joe average who just happens to like run with superheroes more so than but, batman <laughs> Well, you see, the thing is, well, but that's why he's broke Batman. So broke Batman means, oh, so Batman is, well, you know, I was the sort of billionaire. So when I decided to embark on my life of crime, I joined the circus and learned all the secrets of the underworld. Whereas um, Clint Barton was like, well, I was an orphan, so I joined the circus and learned all the secrets of the underworld. Also, hey, I can build cool things. Yeah. And I'm insanely skilled at fighting and ninja stuff and shooting things. <laughs> so it's like, aside from the fact that, you know, Bruce Wynn has his billionaire privilege. Um, and this is actually sp- specifically why I reject the idea that Hawkeye is broke Green Arrow. <laughs> Well, uh, because Green Arrow, as we all know, is a sad imitation of Batman. Um, well, no, Green Arrow's not bad, but he's not, you know, I don't think of Green Arrow as a person who is solving problems on his own. Hmm. I mean, yes, he learned how to, essentially, Green Arrow learned how to fight and to shoot while he's on an island. He didn't dedicate his life to it like Batman or have it happenstance in his life in, in the way that it was with Hawkeye. In his own way, Hawkeye is the slumdog millionaire of superheroes because it wasn't his choice to, oh, I'll join the circus and I'll learn archery and I'll learn to fight and I'll learn swordsmanship and I'll learn all these different tricks and, and tricks from, you know... <laughs> You know, Hans Junkman, the king of, of junk, junk or law, you know, mm-hmm. I'll figure out how to build the weapons I need to be the superhero in this world. And, you know, I think that, I mean, granted, Oliver Queen makes, has great arrows, some of which I'm assuming he builds himself, but I don't know. When it comes to trick arrows, I think, so for example, when you talk about Trick Arrows, I actually think Hawkeye more than I think Green Arrow. Yeah. I mean, no. it, it depends on the era. Green Arrow used to use more Trick Arrows, and these days it's like more straight up arrows. Yeah. And for what it's worth, I mean, I think Hawkeye does too. Yeah. I think, but you know what? But the idea that Hawkeye never had a support system to fall back on, much in the way that Peter Parker never had a support system to fall back on. Everything he creates is created from himself. Mm-hmm. 
And um, one of the reasons I bring this up is because the new issue, new issue of Freefall is out, which is a straight to digital. And we really get to see Hawkeye being a broke Batman. Where he is outsmarting the criminals and and in his own way also like making deals. I love the whole scene with him and Fisk in New York and he's like, Look, we both know that Parker Robbins is causing problems. Mm-hmm. And they're like, Yeah, I can fix it here. Let's make a deal with Count Nefaria. Count Nefaria is more than happy to stomp on some Parker Robbins. <laughs> and he and and but then he says no. Because no matter how far he goes down, he doesn't want to go that low. In that sense, one could maybe argue that he is all—he is maybe a broke Green Hornet, too. But Batman, I think, would have the same things, you know? I mean, that's the problem, is when you're broke, you have to find your own ways to do things. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so within that, I, I really think this idea that Hawkeye is a much more complex character than people give him credit for. You know, yes, he is the human with the arrows. And yes, the arrows are an odd system of delivery for your amazing toys. But are they? Are they really any more weird than the utility belt that most most of these guys are wearing? Um, For what it's worth, the archery, if, if nothing else allows you to shoot the arrow from a distance so you don't have to get too up close. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that's my thinking. And that ties into one of the things I actually am really excited about uh, because, of course, as you know, there are, there are very few new comics, but we have a lot of old comics. And one of this week's old comics for me was Dr. Octopus Ooh. Year One. Phil, have you ever read this book? No, actually, I have not. It's actually really amazing. I mean, it is a great origin for Dr. Octopus to Mm -hmm. start, which is, you know, I think really something you want from anything. And it gets Dr. Octopus so perfectly well Hmm. within our modern understanding. And it, it really, I mean, honestly, it kind of almost crosses the line into a little bit of fan fictiony obsession with Spider-Man, like some, some you know, Superman Lex Luthor stuff here, mm-hmm. where it's like, well, you know, uh, except it's explicit and in the comic, um, where he is, you know, he's like, oh, you know, I am naked while I envision you because you Whoa. and I are brothers of the Atom. And it's like, okay, Doc, we... But it's, you know, I, it sounds funny when I say it, but I tell you, it is beautifully written. It is beautifully drawn. drawn. This is uh, Zeb Wells and Kari Andrews. Um, and they just do an amazing job on this book. And it essentially tells the story of, you know, a young Otto Octavius, and he's a super genius, and his uh, father, Tolbert, uh, Octavius, who is abusive, as we know. Mm-hmm. And um, Tolbert dies at the end of the first issue. Octavius gets a, gets a, uh, a scholarship to MIT. We see him essentially, you know, do what, pay his dues, get his doctorate, unlike that um, oh, no. dropout doom. Uh-huh. You know? And at no point do you doubt the beauty of Dr. Octopus's story in this. It is really brilliantly told hmm. and wonderfully illustrated. You know, it had, and this is like, this is, I think this was about the time Spider-Man 2 came out, so maybe they were trying to Probably. monopolize on, you know, that Doc Ock fever <laughs> that we had in 19, uh, whatever that was, when Spider-Man 2 came out. I think it was like, was um, it 2003 or 4? Th- oh, 2004, uh, wait. I think, yeah, yeah, 2004, I think, yeah, yeah. But um, it's, I know there's an ad for White Chicks, uh, the movie in it. Mm -hmm. Um, This is back when comic books had ads for things other than comic books. But um, it is, it's an interesting tale. It really, it, it humanizes Doc Ock without pulling any punches of his sociopathology. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, you almost have a bifurcated um, uh, persona 
to the fact that we know his mom died. In, oh, sorry, spoilers. We know his mom died in issue three, but issue five, he's still writing letters to her. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes, they should expect, you're correct, Tristan, they should expect spoilers. But it's it's really, um, you know, it tells the story of, of, of Dr. Ock. And what I found most fascinating about it is it has where <laughs> they're trying to create a visual demonstration of radiation. <laughs> Could you help us, Doc Ock? Or could you help us, a uh, young intern Octavius? It's like, oh, plebeians, let me show you how you would make your garish show of the atom. And um, and there's this great thing within it about, like, you know, uh, Octavius's, you know, relationship with the atom and nuclear power and energy of that nature. And this almost romantic feeling he feels towards it. And essentially his defeat at the hand of Spider-Man comes on some level to his disappointment in the Atom itself. It's beautiful and it's great, but you do have this concept where Dr. Octopus in basically creates the, the mechanism by which Spider-Man gets created. And then Spider-Man existence sort of inspires Dr. Octopus to create his arms because there is this this scene again, spoilers, he and his mother are watching Spider-Man on television and he realizes, oh, Spider-Man must be a cyborg because he catches, he catches that he's using web shooters. Hmm. So he's trying to understand you know, what the web shooters are. And then uh, it comes to this amazing fight at the end you know, with, you know, and it follows, you know, our comic book lore very well. Um, you know, it comes to this fight at the end where, where, um, Octopus is saying, oh, you know, I can hear the, the queen's accent in your voice. And, you know, it does this whole, hmm. you know, Hannibal Lecterian sort of dissection to sort of say that Spider-Man is not, you know, worthy of the gift of the atom. And then sort of defeats him. Basically, he tells him, you know, you know, a fifteen dollar chem, you know, fifteen minutes and a five dollar chemistry set. And I found the way to defeat you, where he creates a feedback loop within his arms that essentially shocks him. And I love the fact that they have this duality with Doc Ock in this, where sometimes he's mild mannered Doctor Otto Octavius. Mm-hmm. And he says, oh, I kind of lost my head there. You know, sort of <laughs> almost like uh, King Tut in the old 66 Batman series where he's like, oh, yes, I, I've struck my head. And now, goodness me, did I do all of that? Oh, my. My, oh, my. And <laughs> honestly, I, I am just in love with this. I mean, Dr. Otto Octavius, you know, you know, he is one of my favorite villains in the Marvel Universe. Oh, yeah. He's definitely my favorite spider-man villain because i do feel he is so not he is he is a insane thematic villain who at the same time maintains a level of reality within within his sociopathology that makes me really appreciate him um and this brings us to uh the barrel of which sony is scraping Oh boy. And the jackpot announcement that jackpot that character you've been waiting for is coming to the Sonyverse. Um, Along with Madam Web. Madam Web I can get. Yeah. I can see the stories you can do with Madam Web. Jackpot it's like either someone said no no man I want to do a jackpot story. It's like it, look if, and here's the thing here's the thing about it. If Disney were to say to me, "Hey Charlie, is there a character you want to really work with? And I'd say, oh, man, you know, I'd love to work with yeah. Boulder, of course, and Gwenpool. And I'd say, and of course, Ben Grimm, you know, without a doubt. And they say, okay, well, why don't you do a story about Ben Grimm? Oh, look, look, look Ray's in the room. He even says, you know, you could use uh, the Trapster paste pot Pete. I'd, I'd watch a Trapster movie before a uh, Jackpot movie. Well, yeah, I don't know if they have rights to the traps, so that's the problem. Yeah, I wonder if he's Spider-Man or Fantastic Four. If they can no, see. he's Fantastic Four. Yeah. He is 100% Fantastic His first appearance is fighting uh, the Human Torch. Yes. Pace Pop Pete, 
um, the Wingless Wizard, those are all Fantastic Four villains, who actually started as Human Torch villains. Mm. So, yeah, no, they don't have any rights to them. I would love to see a Pace Pat Pete film, and that'll be in the new Marvel verse that we're going to be seeing soon. Um, Because it's coming. We're going to get to that in a minute, too. But I have to think that 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 there's a director who Sony really wants to work with who really said, no, I want to do Jackpot. Like, to the... So, it would tell me that, like, whoever it is, I'm guessing Steven Spielberg really wants to do a jackpot film either that or it's like marvel I like can't a ma- think of anyone else with the clout level to say no we're doing jackpot or do you think it was and just it was, like, was it just cheap it's like uh, marvel's like yeah okay we'll, we'll let you have jackpot yeah don't worry yeah well i mean that that is the possibility that 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 of all that in the deal yeah marvel may get some kind of approval on what characters they can use yeah so if you have a situation where Marvel gets to say, uh, no, we're like, for example, like Mysterio. No, we're, we got an idea for Mysterio. We're doing it. So long as the steel's in, in place, you can't use Mysterio. Yeah. You can't use Rhino. You can't use Doc Ock. And so they go, well, who do we have? Now, I think there's a lot of places you could go before you got to jackpot again the ca- the character was basically a plot device because in the beginning of brand new day when they broke up that marriage it was just oh look there's this new red-headed female superhero you know teasing that it's mary jane a- even the name jackpot it's like you know face a tiger know. yeah <sighs> which interestingly enough so if you're watching right now if you're watching right. um spider-man maximum venom venom you had the introduction of Mary Jane Watson into the the animated Disney X Spider Man universe. And she does not say face it tiger, you just hit the jackpot. Yeah. So it's interesting. So maybe there's some deal with that. It's like, okay, we won't have our Mary Jane say jackpot. You can have jackpot. This is why I, I think there's some kind of weird negotiations going. It, it's just weird that that's what you're gonna seize on because, again, it's not like Spider-Man doesn't have lots of villains, but you have to remember MCU already has the Tinkerer, the Shocker, and the Vulture, um, and Mysterio. They likely have already called dibs on Octavius, the Lizard. Um, although I think the lizard might be a free spot they could use. Yep. And honestly, just doing a lizard standalone horror pick might be a great idea. I mean, given that she doesn't even tie into, like, a spider arc, it's really weird to pick Jackpot. Unless they want to do something Mephisto-related. And it's like, how about we get this Black Cat or Silver Sable stuff like out there before we we start looking at jackpots, you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, Silver Sable, that was iffy to start with. But I think people would have been down for a Black Cat. Yeah. I mean, even, yeah, I mean, yeah, it has shades of Halle Berry. Um, Catwoman, yeah. Uh, Catwoman in it, but it's not Halle Berry Catwoman. No. Um... I think, you know, I mean, it sounds stupid to say it out loud, but I, I think they might have backed off Black Cat because she's white. And this idea that, oh, well, if we do a Black Cat character and we cast a white person in it, I'm just saying how, like, weird people in offices might talk, like, overanalyze things. Because one thing we've seen about offices that are not Disney yeah. Is that apparently people overthink things in bad ways. But again, too, you don't have to cast her as white. I mean, in the comics, Selena Cow is white, but, you know, Halle Berry wasn't. Uh, the new Catwoman yeah, isn't going to be they white. Yeah, they certainly don't want that comparison. Oh, uh, yeah. But I mean, they're doing it with the... I mean, you want you may want the Eartha Kitt comparison. Yeah. And, there's, that. and in the new Batman, I mean, that Catwoman's not going to be white either. So it's, you know... Is she, oh, yeah. That, that's yeah. right. That's right. They, yeah. So... I don't know what they're. I don't know why they back. Honestly, I don't know any real reason why they backed off on a Black Cat movie. I think they wanted to do Black Cat and Silver Sable, and then realized Silver Sable maybe didn't have legs for a character. Hmm. And then, but then, why not just develop a Black Cat? But maybe they thought, well, Black Cat needs 
Spider Man, but I think that's a mis a, a yeah, bad but they, idea. Yeah, but they've done Venom without Spider Man. It's like <laughs> I could see Black Cat without Spider Man way more than Venom. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, and they did a decent job on Venom. Yeah. Although, I I mean, I don't like I don't like modern Venom in general. Yeah. I don't like any cannibalistic characters. Well, and that's like that's like a real turn off for me. Anytime people start eating other people, I'm like, dude, that's weird. It, well, I don't like a lot in the Ultimate Universe, Tristan. Oh, but yes, the Blobs cannibalism is freaking weird. <laughs> I don't know, because he's fat, and apparently that's what they thought fat people did. They thought <laughs> that fat people would eat anything put in front of him. <laughs> they don't like fat people in the Ultimate Universe. I don't know why. It's a weird place. I don't exist in the fa- uh, in the ultimate universe. It's it's a strange, strange place to be. When it's like they, they but, when they just like milk that they just they milk that venom character to death. You know, back, you know when they first introduced the character, he would show up maybe once a year. And it's like okay, okay, but then it's like starting in the nineties, they started throwing mini series at him. They started getting ongoing oh, books, yeah, and because he had a cool design, he was a very nineties character. Oh yeah, and not for nothing. Let's let's be let's be clear here. It ain't like Venom has go, has lost popularity. They s- crafted him onto Spider Spider Gwen. You uh, know. Oh yeah, I mean you got you got tw- you, so many variations on symbiotes now. Yeah, Spider Gwen has one Carnage. I mean you had Flash Thompson for a while. I mean. Yeah, I mean so it's it's a character with legs. Oh, I, yeah. I have no. I have no qualms with Venom in and of itself, Mm-mm. although I do think that Sony has not done a good Venom. I think that the problem with Venom is he needs a relationship with Spider-Man. Yes. Whatever that... Or he needs he needs a relationship with someone other than Eddie Brock. Yes. And I think that focusing on the Eddie Brock relationship is always a problem. I actually think separating Eddie from the symbiote and then exploring a Flash Thompson narrative would be a better arc for that. But hmm. I'm not in charge at Sony, and Sony is apparently desperate, like Warner Brothers level desperate, to have something worth watching. And, you know, that's the difficulty for these companies. Because, as we said on our last show, Capes and Lunatics, scroll down, um, you know... Warner's is doing a big push for this new streaming service, their Disney Plus rival. And really, I think the only new content that we know of is the Not Too Late show with um, Elmo, which, not for nothing, I'm 100% there for. I'm not going to be too proud to say I'm down for a good Elmo show. I love Muppets. There's a lot of Muppet content coming. But um, I think outside of the Muppets, and I don't know how much of that Muppet content is dropping on day one, it is a weird thing to not be pushing your best products. And the same thing with Sony. Mm -hmm. So Sony, within its catalog, could say, we're going to do a standalone Rhino story. Now, for those who don't know, Rhino is, you know, probably one of my most heartfelt um, villains. He's no Doc Ock, but, you know, Doc Ock is kind of beyond a super... The thing about the Rhino is he is a character with pathos. He is a character who made a bad deal, and he wasn't a nice guy beforehand, but he wasn't the worst human being you could imagine. He's, he was like one of the kind of guys who's like, hey, I'm not going to kill a kid, you know? Yeah. I'll kill, yeah, I'll kill, I'll kill him, I'll kill his wife. I'm not going to kill their kid. I mean, that, that, there's a line. And I mean... I it's not a big line, but dude, let me have a line. And I mean, so you bring up the rhino. I mean, even if they think one villain, can, you know, who isn't Venom can't hold their own movie... I mean, there was two miniseries in the 90s, and then there was another one, you know, during the Superior Spider-Man era with, you know, it was, you know, it during Superior Spider-Man, it was the Superior Foes of Spider-Man. It's, and, you know, it's a group, of, it's, a, it's a group of villains, you know, you could do like the comics have like Rhino, I think they had 
speed demon at one point, you know, so there's your speedster, you have boomerang. They should put in Captain Boomerang, yes. Well, they, well, it's Marvel, it's Boomerang, not Captain Bo- yeah, but, yeah. Has he always been Captain, I, I thought he was called Captain Boomerang at one point. No, DC's got Captain Boomerang, no, Marvel's just Boomerang, yeah. But I know DC has Captain Boomerang, yeah. but I thought Marvel, sort of like how they both have scarecrows. Yeah, no, I don't I think he was Boomerang ever- was Captain Boomerang. Nah, I don't, th- I don't think so, but. He actually briefly changed his name, for those who don't remember, to Outback. <laughs> Bloomin' Onions. Anyway. <laughs> it was a bad name. But there's I mean, no, there's no argument on that point. But, but you bring um, up the whole you bring up the whole Captain Boomerang thing. It's like, hey, do a do a superior foes of Spider Man, make it your suicide squad, Sony. Make it make do your su- version of Suicide Squad, but with Spider Man villains. Well, you know what the problem is, is hmm. they know here's the real problem. Here's the real problem for Sony. They know that Marvel will do any of their villains better. So when Marvel so when Marvel says, you know, we want to do, you know, yeah, we're going to introduce Doc Ock, we're going to introduce Green Goblin, we're going to introduce all these characters. You know, Sony's like, I don't know if I want to do that character now because I know they're going to be better. And is it worth us investing in? building a rhino story when we know that marvel's going to do a rhino story better than we could ever hope to and it really is just sort of the creative the the problem is is that sony is bad at what they do and they know they're bad at what they do And, and because they're bad at what they do and they know what they're bad at what they do um Yes, yeah, thank you, Sarah. Sarah, Sarah says true. Uh, because they <laughs> blooming onion yum. She also likes the Captain Boomerang reference. Yes. Um, hi, Sarah. Uh, <laughs> because they know they're bad at what they do, they don't necessarily want to blow what they're going to do on on what they have. And so, yeah. So they're looking. They look at Madam Web and. Honestly, I think Madam Web is the reach for them. I think, and honestly, I think if they're going to do a Madam Web story, they got to do a nineteen. They got to do a nineteen forties Madam Web. Let's go back to the future with Madam Web and say, like, "Oh, I see old things, and I'm a, uh, I'm hot Madam Web." You I know? mean, I mean, exactly. As I mean, they do at Marvel. Well, I mean, it. yeah. When Madam Web first showed up, she's really old, so it's like you could always do, like you were saying, a period piece. You know, years before she ever meets Spider Man. So it's like, hey, why isn't Spider Man in this? Oh, well, it's you know, decades before they meet. You know, I mean, they could arguably do the Spider Queen, which I think. They might, I think, is an open. I think Spider Queen might be an open character, where it's like tangentially Marvel adjacent. She was like the first character with web shooters, mm. and I could imagine they could actually build a Golden Age Spider Verse with a Spider Queen and a Madam Web, and this kind of weird storyline in that i mean there's things they could do do you think and do, you th- that I, do you think they're just going through the rolodex all, all you know all the characters they have rights to and they're like hmm where can we make money because you think it's just is it a question of not if but when they're going to sell those rights back or you think they're just like okay let's see what we can make well, money on now possibility that, and here's the thing and this is something matt pat went into a whole thing about um <laughs> If someone buys Sony, they lose Spider-Man whole hog. Mm. So Sony is in this spot where if they get bought by someone else, they don't have Spider-Man. Uh, but if they don't get bought by someone else, they can make bad Spider-Man films. Yeah. Or they can make a deal with Bar- Marvel to sell Spider-Man back. Exactly. So they're in this constant push-me-pull-you where they're thinking, okay... Are we going to be acquired by someone? Are we going to sell to Disney? Or are we going to try and build a Spider universe? Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, I'm going to throw this out there. If they're throwing out Jackpot, either they have nothing to throw out or they absolutely know exactly what they want to throw out. And 
if they are saying, let's talk about jackpot, maybe there is a Sony Universe idea that they are going to manifest some kind of story with jackpot because she is tied to that brand new day. Mm. Remember, the standalone Spider-Man films are still theirs. Yes. So they can kill Aunt May in their universe. Oh. And even if they don't have a Mephisto, there is lots of other demons they can call upon. Azeroth, Metreon, Zinthros. They can bring in something, an unnamed presence, Ooh. who can arrange things. Yeah. And that is going to bring in a jackpot. But what if what if they what if they actually turn the the you know the whole thing with jackpot that which was a big letdown in the comics? What if they actually make that Mary Jane? Because I mean, look at the look at look at look at the MCU. The MJ we have isn't Mary Jane; it's Michelle. Well, that could be an interesting line too. Is if we actually explore a um, Michelle who everyone calls MJ yes. into a Mary Jane who is Jackpot, that would be interesting. Mm-hmm. We're going to have to see where they go with that. Um, I mean, there's lots of things we can do there. Um, I'm excited about it, and I'm also worried about it, but that is, that is, mm-hmm. that is, as we say, the, um, the Sony-verse. It's almost as bad as the DC universe, but you know they have a universe that they know what they're doing it with with it. Uh, let me just see here. Oh, did you did did you did you want to talk about Ruby Rose? I'm sorry, what? Did you want to talk about Ruby Rose leaving Batwoman? Oh yeah, Ruby Rose is leaving Batwoman, which is after one season. After one season, well, you know, people leave. Yeah, I mean. I, I don't know what to say about I mean, I haven't been watching. It is saying, since I don't get Channel 11, since I don't get the CW on my TV. Yeah. You know, and I have to go to, and I have to go to the CW app to see it. You know, it's hard for me to follow it. So, um, I, mean, I, I haven't been watching Batwoman. I mean, it was renewed already for a second season. She was going to get at least one more yeah. season. So, I mean... <laughs> Yeah, well, that's the thing is, I got to think Ruby is leaving because she wants to leave, not because they didn't like her. Uh, I was reading stuff. I thought it was a little column A and a little column B. She like, I don't know if she want she didn't want to be there, and you know, because of her attitude, they didn't want her there either. I it's. I mean, well, that's a possible. Well, but that you know, here's what I'll say: It's like if her attitude is, I don't want to be here. I understand why other people don't want her to stick around. Yeah, I think both both sides were grading on each other. Maybe you know. <laughs> yeah, but but within that concept, it's it, it comes down to her not wanting to be there. Yes, it's you know, and it, now if she doesn't want to be there because she didn't like the job, well, then you know. Okay, Fred, you knew the job was dangerous when you took it. Um, well, yeah, I think I think Lilith, we brought this up real quick on Legends uh, the other day. Uh, I think Lilith was saying that Ruby Rose isn't always the most depend. You know, she's not known to, like, stick out commitments, like, long term and stuff. Then why did you hire her? I don't make because she was maybe because she was a big LGBTQ namer. Wasn't like it, in it, in a negative way. I mean, that was I don't thing. know. I, I'm not that. Said it was a bad thing. Like, yeah, okay, yeah. I, I mean, know. I mean, I know she got a lot of hate when they first announced she was becoming she was going to be Batwoman. A lot of a lot of people were like, "Oh, she's not gay enough," or you know. I, I, I yeah, it's one of those things. So it's for like, anyone in this, this <laughs> age, you know. I'm sorry, kids. You know. Everyone's experimented with heterosexuality at this point. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I guess I, my most excitement about the hear, hearing that Ruby Rose is leaving is, oh, well, hey, maybe this will be Rosario Dawson's chance to break into live action yeah. uh, DC Universe. Uh, yeah, but do you think CW is going to be able to pay the money Rosario Dawson uh Commands these days and deserve. I mean, and deserves, but 
Yeah, well, and, I, and I just wonder. I wonder if Disney has her locked down. I mean, between you know, she was in the, the Netflix stuff, and now she's going to be on Mandalorian. I I wonder. If... You know, she's still at the sides mm, of the yeah. of the Disney. In fact, one of the things Tristan Tristan made a point to me to me today hmm. was that Ashoka's voice gets heard in that uh, spoilers in the. End of uh, Rise of the Rise of the Skywalker. Mm-hmm. Of all the Jedi, you hear Ashoka's voice in there as well, and so that could imply Ashoka's dead. Although, as I pointed out to Tristan, you know, death is not death for a Jedi. You know, I didn't say it that way, but I, I you know, I said, well, that doesn't necessarily mean she's dead. It just means that her that among as as Rey became all of the Jedi. She heard a show his voice. That doesn't mean the show his death. And 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 I don't know. Can the force work differently through time and space? Like if a Jedi dies at a future date, can they? I don't know. Will the themselves into the past? Into the past? Or, yeah, maybe because the force is through all things. I yeah. mean, we don't know enough about the force to know exactly how that's going to play out. You know, so. I mean, it's entirely possible that, yeah, I mean, you know, a creature, a person in the future could come back to the past and vice versa via the force. The force is eternal and is non-temporal because we know the force is non-spatial. Yes. And we've known that, uh, for those of you who want to get all, all, all nitpicky from the original uh, series where Darth Vader starts choking someone through a view screen. <laughs> You know, and it's just the idea that, you know, it's like, no, the force is through you and I'm one with the force and the space does not matter. It doesn't matter that you're in a whole other ship in a whole other part of the galaxy. I'm going to force choke you. And within that concept, you could argue that, yeah, obviously when you could force choke someone in the past. Now, obviously, there's probably going to be problems with force choking someone in the past, but force choking someone in the future or traveling to the past or traveling to the future or doing whatever you do. Now, if there's a closed loop of time, then it doesn't matter what you do, but, you know, it creates this possibility for you to do these things. So, yeah, so so Ashoka might be not be dead. She may have just been called to the gathering of the Jedi to create the rise of the Skywalkers or she's dead and that was her force ghost. We don't know. We'll see when she shows up by played by Rosario Dawson in the Mandalorian. I was going to say, could she get killed in the Mandalorian? I don't think they're going to kill her. That's the thing. It's like, if she dies, well, uh, yeah, I think it's I mean, an off-screen death. Yeah, because I was going to say, that's it. the Mandalorian takes place years before Rise of Skywalker. So. Yeah. Anyway, but uh, yeah, that's a whole thing. Um, uh, let's see. We talked about the web. We talked that. Let me see. Here. Oh, Russian mutants. I want to touch on Russian mutants for a moment. All right. So we know there's this. How will they ever introduce mutants into the Marvel Universe? This is what the kids are saying, Phil. Yes. And um, we have a film that's coming up pretty soon <clears throat> about how unique individuals were chosen at a young age to be trained to be super uh, assassins and whatnot. Gee, what if one was a mutant? <laughs> And this is the thing in Marvel continuity. Everyone's like, the X-Men, the X-Men, the X-Men. It's like, actually, there were mutants all over the world. Well, yeah. And one of the places we had mutants was the Soviet Union. And unlike the U.S., so we were just like, dude, we got like just, we're growing superheroes? Thank you, Chernobyl. Oh, Children of the Atom. Well, oh, yeah, that's the other. Uh, that's the other thing too. It's like you know, in six one six Marvel, yeah, it, it's all you know, mutants evolved, you know. But I think in uh, the Ultimate, uh, you know, in Ultimate X Men, everyone thought they, the mutants were the same way, but then I think they are revealed eventually. It's like, oh no, the U.S. government that was like a U.S. government experiment that was uh, responsible yeah. for the rise of mutants. That was stupid. 
Um, but I'm I mean, just saying, it, what, would the movies do that? Would the MCU do that? Here's a good rule of thumb. Unless your name is Gank or Miles, everything in the Ultimate Universe is stupid and should be forgotten. <laughs> I'm sorry, Gank. You know, honestly, I call Ned Gank right now because Ned is Gank and yeah. Gank is Ned and never the twain shall meet and Gank is awesome and we love him. Mm -hmm. And Miles is very cool. Yes. We like Miles. Um, I think I like Gank a little more than I like Miles, but that's okay. I'm not going to judge Miles just because Gank is better. But everything else in the Ultimate Universe is lousy. Well, as you see, what what's what these days in Marvel, what's left from the Ultimate Universe? Miles and Gang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and, and Miles' family. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, everyone needs a family. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's all that survived from the Ultimate Universe. <laughs> yeah, because nothing in the Ultimate Universe, unlike the MC2 Universe, which still has a beloved existence. That's oh, yeah. the, thing. Like the MC2 universe, which again, is this thing that if Sony really wants to do something, why aren't they telling the Sparter Girl story See, with exactly. Toby McGuire? Bring back Toby McGuire as Peter Parker with one as one leg Peter Parker and have that story of him as the dad as Mayday Parker suddenly finds her her, her uh, charisma, you know? And all you need him for is one movie, kill him off. That's her Uncle Ben moment. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, you could. Then you gotta introduce Morlan. And then again, they have Morlan and the entire uh, people who eat sputter totems for reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, There's that, a whole bag of hammers in that. But I think that's Sony's path. I mean, that way you don't have to deal with Spider-Man. You do Madam Web stuff in the past. You could do the MC, you know, Spider-Girl stuff in the future. That way you don't really... I mean, you can have old P man Peter Parker in the future, but you really don't have to deal with, you know, current Spider-Man. Yeah, I know. It's And for what it's worth, bringing Toby for back for that. Yeah. I think that's perfect. You know, have... Toby can grow a goatee. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the, the, the I'm sure the man can grow facial hair if he if you asked him to. And, and it's um, Hollywood; they can always fake it if he can't. Yeah, exactly. And so the idea of Toby McGuire as Sparter, as Spar as Mandy Parker's dad, <gasps> having Toby McGuire in that, that it just seems like a brilliant idea. And Kristen Dunst. I am totally down for bringing back Kristen Dunst as Mary Jane. You know. I don't know if Kristen Dunst wants to do a mom role, but you know what? Do a mom role. Hey. It's not going to kill you, Kristen. No. You can use the work, so. Um. I mean, I mean, you know, uh, what's her face is Aunt May now, and everyone's like, oh, it's hot Aunt May, you know? <laughs> now, well, that's another thing. Um, crazy thoughts. So, oh. among my crazy thoughts of the recent years is... <laughs> Okay, what if we introduce mutants in the Black Widow film? Yes. Because we're dealing with Soviet super soldiers, and like 90% of the Soviet super soldier program were mutants. Mm -hmm. Because apparently, crazy as it might sound, they didn't just let people walk onto nuclear bomb bases in the Soviet Union. They were like, they had like strict security on this kind of stuff for reasons. Um,. <laughs> So you had very few nuclear accidents that resulted in superheroism. Mm -hmm. um, and so most of the Soviet super soldiers wound up being mutants because they didn't want to have to write a whole story about why this person is a mutant. Um, although they eventually got Perun into it, which would be cool. I would love to see a Perun. In um, which is the basically the Soviet Thor. Yes, I would love to see him wind up in Black Widow, and that's the thing. It's like if we were to, and it doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be like I am Vanguard, and this is my sister Darkstar, and we have these amazing powers. And yes, we were born with them because we're cool. Um, I would just love to see some 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 files, some things that say, "Hey, here's Perun, here is Vanguard and Darkstar, and a major, an Ursa Major, 
or Major Ursus, you know? And you, know, you Major could, Vladimir Ursus. And you, know, you could always do, you could always say, you know, parts of this project were st- stolen by Strucker, you know, oh, you know, the, you know, Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch thought Strucker gave hit them their powers, but they were actually mutants. <laughs> well, that would be, although now they're not. So weirdly enough, it's like I have a people's... feeling they're going to be mutants again. They did that whole thing when they were, you know, the whole fight with Fox and they were like, oh, well, they have Ma- Magneto. We have Scarlet Witch. So guess what? They're not Magneto's kids. Uh, I don't know. I'm Honestly, it's all crazy. Yeah. I, I just I know Lilith uh, does not want the grand unification. I just want it at this point because I love extended universes. Yeah. And when it comes to it, that's the thing. It's like, okay, no, yes, I get the point that, oh, well, if only one person owns the property, then they're going to say, well, not yet spend a lot of money for the property. <laughs> but then you're going to lose popular appeal. That's, that's the thing about selling a product. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, you can make a Rolls Royce. And people are going to know that Rolls Royces are great cars, even though nobody has a Rolls Royce. But if you want to say, oh, this is a great m- movie, but you can't see it, eventually we're going to say, well, it can't be that good of a movie. Because at the end of the day, a Rolls Royce is just a car. <laughs> and you just drive a Rolls Royce. Yeah. And how much better a Rolls Royce is than a Cadillac or a Lincoln or even a freaking Honda Civic? How much, like, that incrementally better level of it gets to this point where, like, "Mm, I just don't have any interest in the product. And making curated stories for uh, a small elite of people that you want want to spend a lot of money on, that seems unlikely if your company is a mass media company. So... I I endorse Disney buying a lot of product and making a lot of good product. As long as they keep on making good product, I'm happy. If they stop making good product, then I will stop patronizing their products. <laughs> That's how the market works. But, um, yeah, anyway. Uh, one last item I wanted to talk about is uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., as we all know, is coming back this week. And starting in the 1930s, when it's just some Agent Carter stuff, which is why me and Maz over on... Um, enough said. Enough, well, no, not enough said. Oh, Agent Carter. Ahead, Agent Carter, full stream ahead. Talking yes. about uh, Agent Carter. We're going to be coming back to enough said, because now there's content for enough said. I want to say they're going to be running our stuff on uh, enough said, too, but I don't know. I, I'm not in charge of streaming or editing. I just talk into a microphone and Maz talks into his microphone, and sometimes I listen to Maz, and sometimes he listens to me. But honestly, it's nothing scripted on these shows. This is uh, Chaz and Maz live. Um, yes, yes, the, yes. To pull back the curtain, Rob Southgate makes the decisions. I do the uh, the background work, and Charlie Esser comes in and looks pretty. I I talk pretty. Let's be clear. I talk pretty. I don't look pretty. No one is looking at this. If you're watching the YouTube live uh, streaming of these things, you're not saying, gotta get me some of that. Lilith Hellfire is not on camera. You are my eye candy. Uh, as much as I can be. <laughs> That's why I grew the mustache. Mustache. Gotta give people something. <clears throat> I have a magnificent mustache. <laughs> but, um, what was I going to say? So... We're going back to the 30s. We know we're going to see Sosa. I wonder if we might introduce a Ben Parker. Hmm. This is an interesting question. Because there is this idea that Marvel has the TV rights to Spider-Man. Oh, yeah. I think they have. Don't That's they have why all, there's been. Don't they have all the rights to Spider-Man except for the movies? That is the statement. But you know these the essentially essentially what it is is there's lots of lawyers involved yeah. and lots of contracts involved. So so the the contract says 
We give all film rights for uh, Spider-Man and his extended universe to Sony in perpetuity for a bunch of money so that, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. So we can keep the lights on at the comic book company this week. And within that is this thing. We say, well, you said film rights. Well, what is film? Is film cinema? Is film television? Is it streaming? And these are all very vague questions that no one has answers for today because these contracts were written 30 years ago. Yes. So when you look at something like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which is in the MCU, but maybe it's in another timeline now. What are timelines? Is that the same universe? I don't know. Why are you asking me? And so if we are going to say, oh, here in the 1940s and 1950s, here's this young guy named named Ben, <laughs> who's all sweet on that Ms. Parker, says, you know, I'm a big guy, and I got power in this world, and I got to tell you, man, even though I got that power, I know I got responsibility, too. And you do that whole story. These are things that we can do in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And in its own way, kind of touch these characters, even though officially they're not part of our Spider-Man universe's MCU. They are things that make them unattainable to the good folks at Sony. Hmm. Because immediately everyone's going to say, well, we we got our Ben Parker. We got our Ben Parker. Um, you know, that's who he was, and he was done well. I don't know if I want to see what the Ben Parker is that Sony's going to drag out of, uh, out of the barrel. That could be a jackpot for all we know. And so we go from there. <laughs> and that's that. Um... We're getting late here. One last thing I want to talk about real quick. Uh, book I picked up this week. Thorian. Oh, yeah. Of the New West Guardians. Number one from Amalgam. I don't know if you've heard of this company called Amalgam. They're a little indie company. Uh, I think they uh, just came out. Um, John Romita Jr. does. The, and this is actually, I got to say this. Uh, I'm going to get all lilithy here for a minute. I'm going to mm -hmm. talk about the artist. Uh, this is some of the best work I've seen John Romita Jr. do. Ooh. I've always said that, you know, I like, because that's the thing, I like John Romita Jr.'s work. I just think that a lot of times, like, his inkers don't know what to do with it. Yeah. I think, like, either they want to go too light. I think that's most of the complaint with him, is that the, that the inkers go too light. He sets the scene, and the inker doesn't want to change the scene. But I think he needs someone, but the point of an inker is to add depth. And so I think that with a really good inker, John Romita Jr. is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I've always loved his the way that he depicts flight, not as propulsion, but as a state of being. And that is such an interesting visual take on flight because no one does it. No one does it except John Romita Jr. makes flight a state of being. Um, and so I like it, uh, Thorian, uh, in Amalgam Comics, uh, it's, it's, it's good, it's good, um, honestly, it's weird because it's, like, a one issue that is written as if it was a collected tale within hundreds of issues. Yeah, a lot of them did that, yeah. Yeah, and it's like, oh, well, here's – and you you're bait, you you have to rely on your own knowledge of DC and Marvel properties to know what's going on in this scene. And they give you just enough to be tantalizing, and then there's not another issue. And it is the most frustrating thing about Amalgam. The tease. I want – Disney to buy DC, not Warner Brothers, just DC, just so that Marvel has complete control of the Amalgam universe because nope. there's so much to do. But, um, yeah. Uh, 
That's that. I already talked Reed Fleming, World Service Milkman. I haven't gotten to any of my uh, Marvel magazines from the 1970s yet. So that's all I got, Phil. Anything else you wanted to talk about? Uh, no, I think uh, no. That's good for that's good with me. That's good for one night. Okay, so Philip, how can people find you? Uh, to talk about things. If you want to uh, talk to me, I'm on Twitter at Nightwing PDP. Or if you want to talk to us on the show, you can always email us, capesandlunatics at gmail.com, or call the voicemail, 614-382-2737. That's 614-38-CAPES. I'm sorry, what was that number again, Phil? 614-382-2737. Oh, that's 38 CAPES. Yeah. See, you know, my problem is, Phil, I don't have tweaked audio headphones because I'm actually using my headphones from work right now. And I often think if I would only buy myself tweaked audio headphones, then I'd be able to hear every clear, crisp syllable you make, and then I'd know what you just said. They're so, the, uh, the thirty-eight kips. That's a that, that that's a good that's a good mnemonic device. Since I did not yet buy my tweaked audio headphones, but you, dear friends, can buy those. And in fact, I think if you want to go down into our links, you can go to Amazon where you can buy just about anything. I bet you can find tweaked audio uh, headphones there. And while you're there, going through our link through Amazon to get to Amazon, you can probably find uh, Podlife the book, which is honestly one of the great tones of this modern age. If you want to understand the podcast culture, the podcast history, the idea of what do podcasters think about the art and the style of podcasting, that's where you want to start. That is your podcasting 101, if you will. Um, You know, I, I know that we are at the early stage of the history of this, but this is the kind of book that will be seen as that original source, that first draft of history of the podcast movement. So you may want to pick that up. It's not too expensive. You can get it digitally uh, through Kindle, or you can actually buy a physical book to hold and pass down generation to generation. And then it becomes, you know, one of these, you know, first editions that you have in your attic that you say, well, you know, if things ever get hard, we can always sell that first edition Pod Life the book. Uh, meanwhile, if you're just looking for some uh, side fun, why don't you go check out oh. Hunt a Killer? That is one of our sponsors, Hunt a Killer. If you've ever wanted to hunt a killer, but, you know, like me, don't want to leave your apartment right now, they will give you all the joys and fun of hunting a killer That's right. in the privacy of your own Do home. it the safe That's- way. Do it the safe way. <laughs> Do it. You don't want to actually deal with killers who might actually kill you, because that's why they're killers. That's their thing. Uh, okay, and that is all of our popular endorsements. In the meantime, if you would like to write to me in that old-fashioned email way, the way our mothers and our fathers and aunts and uncles still do to this day, do so. At superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivityblog, all one word, at gmail.com. And of course, follow me on Twitter, because I'm going to start live tweeting uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Coming back, I want to say this Wednesday. I believe so, um, yeah. Yeah, at Charlie Esser, that's C-H-A-R-L-I-E-S-S-E-R. Look for the two E's in the middle. For quality. For qu- Bing. Thank you, Moss. I forgot you were there. <laughs> Oh my Maz, he is always there for me. He's such a such a a shelter in the storm. All righty, dear friends and listeners, thank you for connecting us connecting with us this week. Please tune in next week and super connect with us again. Good night. Good night. Oh yeah. So we integrated a lot of uh, mentions of our sponsors. Well, yeah. Yes. I think we got the attention. I think between the two shows, we got the attention of uh, Sony and uh, Warner's tonight. Oh uh, well, I certainly hope those guys are listening.